namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sangang namasami I wanted to uh, use this last opportunity uh, at a talk to speak to the subject which we touched on briefly during Tuesday's conversation with Ajahn Chunda, um, a question from Shelley about the role of ignorance in the 12 links of dependent origination was the catalyst for Ajahn Chunda and I speaking a bit about that beginning point of the process which ushers into uh, suffering and loss in the Buddhist psychology. And there's a famous sutta where Venerable Ananda says that dependent origination seems to him simple and clear. And the Buddha responds by saying, don't say that, Ananda. Uh, dependent origination is deep, profound. It is because of not understanding dependent origination, paticca samuppada in Pali, that beings wander blind. And I remember being in Bodh Gaya, uh, last year, in late January, I believe. And uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to go to Bodh Gaya ever, uh, when conditions in the world become a bit more amenable, it's amazing. It's worth the trip. There's thousands of faithful from across the world um, all gathered and uh, there's Tibetan monks and nuns and uh, practitioners prostrating, uh, full-length prostrations, thousands every day. Um, they set up these wooden boards and they prostrate uh, these full-length prostrations on these boards for 12 hours or so a day, uh, some of them. And you always feel a bit... Uh, you can never quite match the Tibetan grandmothers who are uh, somehow managing to keep up this profoundly difficult routine. Uh, it's quite humbling. But when I was there, I had the chance to sit under the Bodhi tree, which is uh, grown from one of the original clippings, which was originally uh, brought from the Buddha's Bodhi tree there down to Sri Lanka. And then later uh, a clipping taken from the Sri Lankan tree and moved back up and replanted when the site was re-revived uh, uh, last century. And I remember my first evening there, I heard them, the monks uh, chanting uh, Paticca Samuppada, the 12 links of dependent origination. And I was so moved because this is the essential insight that the Buddha spoke of on his, uh, or how he articulated the moment of knowledge on the night of his awakening. And it's the insight that he spoke of previous Buddhas, previous beings who have discovered this path also coming into contact with. And it's a profound piece of psychology basically uh, speaking of how ignorance of the Four Noble Truths, namely, leads us to create intentional formations, sankhara, which leads to sense consciousness, vijnana, which conditions uh, name and form, nama rupa, which conditions the six sense bases, 
the eyes, ears, touch, uh, taste, smell, the mind, etc. Which conditions contact of those sense bases with the outside world, pasa. Which in turn contacts uh, conditions feeling, craving, uh, becoming, birth, death, and finally suffering, loss, despair. And it's a notoriously difficult teaching to talk about because it is so complex and filled with numerous feedback loops. And yet it's a wonderful uh, system to try to approach and understand. The question on Tuesday was how avijja or ignorance fits into the whole picture. And... I think that the teachers I've heard of speak of it point to the fact that ignorance in Buddhist thought is ignorance of a skill, namely how to apply the Four Noble Truths to one's experience. And the Four Noble Truths are best perhaps thought of as directives towards how we can approach our experience. We turn towards and comprehend uh, suffering or the stress associated with experience or with certain experiences. We see and abandon the cause of that stress, which is craving which allows the realization of cessation or peace, the third noble truth. And we develop the path to that cessation or uh, the noble eightfold path. And for a long time, I could not figure out how ignorance led to Sankara, the first two links. But there's a sutta, which really, uh, for me, helped a lot. And uh, it's called the Papata Sutta. And it uh, is translated as the precipice. And in it, the Buddha says that those Brahmins and contemplatives who do not understand as it actually is, this is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. And this is the path to that cessation. Revel in fabrications, sankara, reveling in fabrications, they fabricate fabrications, uh, fabricating fabrications that lead to birth, aging, and death. They fall off the precipice of birth, aging, and death. So this sounds esoteric and academic, but what I think it points to is the fact that when we don't see clearly the stress involved in the things we usually chase after, then we continue to buy into them. And that ignorance of how to apply the Four Noble Truths, of how to see clearly the stress and suffering inherent in certain experiences or cravings, uh, ways of acting in the world, means that we continue to produce volition towards those things, which is sankara. Volition or chaitana in Pali is the essential ingredient of sankara. It's a movement outward. So... We see this clearly in, I think, our, our lives um, as we practice and become more accustomed to more peaceful ways of finding happiness, then we begin to see 
clearly, not just because we have a reference point of a more subtle and sweet joy in life, but also because when we meditate every day, we have a chance to really perceive the effect that many of the sources of happiness and satisfaction we've chased after for our whole existence leave us with. So I remember as I, my, my parents and I, we have a joke that uh, practice makes people more and more boring and uh, it's both true and completely false. I remember that as I began to meditate through college, where a lot of my friends would be going off to parties or out, more and more I just wanted to stay home or leave the gathering at 7 or 7.30 and go meditate. And I couldn't really explain it, and it um, or not adequately, but... I saw more and more clearly the stress of constant and unrelenting interaction and desire to be, to not miss out and to go and find new experience. And more and more I had a reference point of what it felt like to sit in quiet and listen to those more subtle and sweet voices in myself that were also the, my strongest and best part. And, and I saw clearly how when I did that, everything in my life became potentized, became um, emboldened by that practice. And so more and more I let go of the more coarse um, forms I'd relied on before for satisfaction. And this is an example of using uh, of the first noble truth at work, of seeing clearly the stress in something and then stepping back. And because one is applying the four noble truths there, because one is not operating from ignorance of those four noble truths, then that outward motion of the heart into something, into a way of acting that causes stress or is bound up with stress doesn't take place. So that first two links of the chain don't occur at least not in that specific situation. Ignorance does not lead to sankara. Ignorance does not usher into uh, formation, volitional formation. And there's a famous experiment uh, which happened in the 1980s, um, I believe, or... Uh, a theory called the peak end rule. And I believe the economist who discovered this uh, got a Nobel Prize. And the experiment consisted in having uh, participants immerse their hands in cold, freezing water for a set amount of time. And then at the very... Uh, so you had a certain control group immerse their hand in this freezing water and then pull it out. And then... Uh, rate, I believe, their experience um, or how willing they were to undergo it again. And then you had another group do the same thing, but they kept their hand in that freezing water for significantly longer. However, the second group, right at the end of the immersion, they raised the temperature in the water by one degree. And the group that had been uh, exposed to the longer cold, but with the slight raise in temperature at the end, remembered their experience uh, as a far more pleasant one 
than the first group, despite the fact that by any real arithmetic they'd immersed their hand in the freezing water for much longer and only had a small repri reprieve in the very end. But because the end of the experience uh, was a pleasant one, that's all they remembered, or most of what they remembered. And similarly, uh, so the theory of peak end rule means that we remember the high point and the end of an experience and forget very easily all the suffering that might be inherent throughout it. And I think this speaks to our inability to see suffering. This uh, indicates why we continue to chase after things which don't actually satisfy us and we're, are rife with, um, with pain is because we are really bad at seeing clearly the balance of pleasure to suffering in experiences. And uh, there's a wonderful sutta called uh, The Shorter Series of Questions and Answers in which a nun, Venerable Dhammadina, who is foremost in expounding Dhamma, is speaking with her former husband, Visaka, who's a merchant and a stream enterer, I believe. Maybe a once-returner, I can't remember. But at some level of awakening, they're both uh, deep practitioners. And this is Majjhima Nikaya 44, and it's one of my favorite suttas. And in it she says that pleasant... Uh, Pleasant feeling is pleasant when it arises and painful when it leaves. Painful feeling is painful when arising and pleasant when it leaves. Neutral feeling is pleasant when experienced with knowledge and painful when experienced without. And I see this as pointing to the fact that when we have a practice of Dhamma, of meditation, and the uh, centeredness of heart and mind to bring presence of mind to our lives, then a subtle joy pervades our whole experience. And also just a clear knowledge of what effect our experience has on us. So all those valleys between the peak and the end of an experience in the peak end rule are no longer lost. And we begin to see and perceive the suffering that experiences do entail. And as we see that, we become less, we achieve a fairer and more balanced evaluation of the costs and benefits of those experiences, and we align our lives with the ones which truly give us nourishment. And the subtler pleasures that are less bound up with peaks and highs become more and more sustaining and attractive because we begin to bring mindfulness and this quality of knowing and presence to our everyday experiences in life. And so there's less need to create and to pour energy into things for this sankara to go out. We still have sankara uh, in terms of intention towards the path. And, but it's generally of a more subtle nature and directed towards more peaceful experiences. So, honestly, I don't want to um, speak too long today, um, partly because I uh, actually would like to have a few minutes to um, discuss with 
all present, anything they would like to talk about. We really haven't had many chances for Q and A, um, and partly because I wanted to speak once more just briefly about um, the aspirations for the, uh, or take any questions, I suppose, around the upcoming um, projects uh, in terms of the monastery that might be taking root in Seattle, perhaps, or the spiritual community, and also of uh, the hermitage that my parents are hoping to begin in Winthrop, Washington. So we'll uh, leave it there. So yeah, it would be uh, good to actually have a few minutes to discuss things that anyone wants to. Um, so Shelley's asking, does peak end also imply the peak of bad experience? That is a great question. <laughs> as far as I know, the experiment focused on pleasant. And in my personal experience, that seems to be most accurate, at least. I think that we, suffering is um, unpleasant to be with and to see, and so we look away from it as much as we can, and so fail to see it clearly in our lives, I think. And I mean, I think that can be seen pretty clearly, and I think most of us have had the experience of being in a relationship that we knew was not going good places. Um, and I've heard that most relationships follow a Shakespearean plot arc. So a Shakespearean plot arc is, uh, instead of a plot line moving, um, towards a climax and then climaxing and then having a brief, uh, anti-climax or, uh, resolution, a Shakespearean plot arc, plot arc is about halfway, the climax comes halfway and then it's halfway, uh, half of the plot line is the resolution. And all that is really saying is that couples spend about half their time breaking up. But um, for me personally, having been in relationships as a layman, I remember that it's, you so want it to work that you cling profoundly tightly to those few moments where it feels like it is working and you ignore all the other signs. At least that was my experience. So for me, peak end rule very much uh, manifested as paying attention to the pleasant and ignoring the painful. And I believe that was specifically what these experiments pointed to as well. So Karine is asking, uh, because of a fortunate life, I find that comfort is quite a hindrance. Constructing my life to be more and more comfortable and not work on my sharp edges. Can you speak to how to leave comfort? That's a very good question too. For me, the issue wasn't so much comfort. 
it was rather dissolution. The issue for me with comfort is that, or with life in middle class society, is that it fractures us in a way we don't even really perceive. And it draws us in a thousand different directions towards uh, Netflix, the phone, a bunch of different interactions with uh, people perhaps we know aren't walking completely in line with us and yet we have difficult restraining ourselves from all these things. And, you know, it's like riding a bike. If we are on course, then and moving towards a goal, towards a proper polaris, you know, a, a, the, the proper North Star, then there's a stability in that, and the heart feels it. But as soon as we start giving in to the thousand different ways that the world bleeds off our purpose and our heart's intuition of what it is truly meant for, then for me, how that manifested was a slow and pervasive queasiness, almost like a splinter. I knew I was doing good things with my life, but never, it was never completely directed until I stepped really onto this path and gave myself to it. There's always the sense that I was moving at an angle to where I really needed to go. And I didn't quite have the restraint to direct my heart completely towards a goal I knew that was worthy of my death, um, of, of this practice. So my life at the monastery, I mean, it has elements of austerity. We only eat once a day, um, sleep much less than I used to. We give up uh, many of the uh, distractions which we might have had as lay people in terms of movies, etc. But it's not austerity for austerity's sake. It's the sila, the morality of simplicity. And that, for me, just implies that you give up all the extraneous things which bleed off one's energy, but that there's not necessarily a need for intense austerity or edge but that if we manage to put in or establish strong boundaries in our lives which direct our energy towards um, towards practice uh, that can be enough even if things are somehow still comfortable but that simplicity and that paring down um, of extraneous uh, obligations and commitments. I mean, that for me is the essential thing. And I think the Buddha established very st clear structures for lay people around that that aren't fully taken advantage of. So, for example, he really pushed for practitioners to take a day a week, a Sabbath day, uposatha, and to dedicate it completely towards practice to hold eight precepts if possible and not eat in the afternoon. Um, you can eat some, uh, you know, take some sugar. Um, to hold the precepts, um, perhaps on that one day a week to really turn off the phone, uh, to put aside obligations and just um, take the day to dedicate towards what's most valuable and to do it, uh, to meditate um, every day, morning and evening, if one can do 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the evening, that's wonderful. And for me, none, those two practices don't, don't reek of austerity, but they do speak to a simplicity of purpose, which I think is essential. So for me, that's the edge, is uh, simplicity and coming back to what is most relevant. Um, 
that being said, I also appreciate a certain amount of austerity. So one can get that just by um, doing the eight precepts, for example, and fasting afternoon. And one's meditation in the evening will be much lighter if one does that. Um, one can do that one day a week is usually the recommendation. So... Perhaps moving towards, Eva says, perhaps moving towards transcendental dependent origination is the way to go from comfort. Yeah, I think that's really a beautiful insight. So for those who don't know, um, Eva is referencing uh, an amazing sutta called the uh, Upanisa Sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya or Transcendent Dep Dependent Origination. And it... Uh, introduces a alternate 12 links after the 12 links that usher into suffering and basically says that stress, suffering, leads to faith. And faith leads to joy. And joy leads to rapture, to tranquility, to calm, and eventually to realization. So it's this shift where the same cycles which have bound us to pain somehow change and there's a pivot point where suffering instead ushers into a search onto this path. And I think we all know when that moment somehow manifested for us, where instead of becoming more bewildered by our pain, we somehow gained an intuition of something beyond it and turn towards a greater purpose and path. And uh, for me, that's speaking to rather than being bound up with suffering and looking for distraction and comfort, um, I think what Eve perhaps is pointing to is the fact that instead of that, one uh, turns from suffering towards pouring one's energy into the transcendent goal of complete liberation of heart. And that's a completely different movement of the heart and is not bound to suffering or to comfort. 